What's up, everyone? Welcome back to State of My Art Podcast. We're really doing it. Episode 8 already. This podcast is brought to you by Vocalese, Throat Spray, Throat Drops, and Manuka Honey Sticks. If you haven't tried these products yet, you are missing out, but you can try them for 15% off by clicking this link right here. It'll bring you to their website where you can get 15% off using my reference link. On today's episode, I have the great pleasure of speaking with one of my very good friends, Alex Baker. (laughs) Alex Baker is one of the most interesting artists I know. He'll tell you exactly what's on his mind at any given moment, and he doesn't care at all to keep up with the trends. He has no social media accounts, no cell phone. He literally gets by with just his laptop and email. He's off the grid, so inevitably has almost zero online presence, yet his ability to perform and be present in the moment always showcases his immense star power. Alex's voice and writing is like no other. Simple melodies with vivid lyrics that'll get stuck in your head for the rest of the month, year even. I highly recommend checking out his albums, The Dusting and January Blues on Bandcamp. That's the only place they exist currently. Alex is an extremely tall musician, wasting his height, writing songs in his basement, like myself. So naturally we have a lot in common and we get into that a bit on this episode. He's been isolated in his Cincinnati home since March, which like many folks has taken somewhat of a toll on his mental health. So I've been chatting a lot with him lately and I'm trying to keep his spirits up. This conversation with Alex Baker happened on September 4th, 2020 at 11 a.m. Not long after I woke up, so please excuse my grogginess. Welcome Alex Baker to the State of My Art podcast. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, sir. You are in Cincinnati, Paddock, Cincinnati in your wonderful Nashville studio. Yeah, the the second you step through the door of the studio, you're in Nashville. (laughs) Nice, because if you're not in Nashville, your music's completely useless and doesn't matter anyway. Right. What are you even doing with yourself? (laughs) (laughs) All right, I think they get the inside joke. Yep. So you're all set up to play some songs for us, too. You will be my first musical performance on State of My Art podcast, and I think that that's very appropriate, as everybody wants to hear. I didn't even brush my teeth. (laughs) You know. (laughs) There you go. And you just had a a nice ham sandwich. You don't want to brush your teeth before you eat a ham sandwich anyway. Yeah. It would ruin it. (laughs) Yeah. So what have you been up to during your pandemic? (laughs) <laughs> I I planted a bunch of trees in my yard. Nice. You still growing peppers back there? I've got uh, jalapeno peppers. I've got uh, cherry tomatoes. I've got cilantro and basil and all that kind. Of, you know, I just grow some shit. Nice. It's great. Nice cilantro now. That's legit. Cilantro is like my favorite herb. Same. I would have to say <laughs> cilantro, lime, and salt. We don't even have to go down to the old Clifton Chipotle anymore. You got cilantro (laughs) and jalapenos right in your backyard. (laughs) It's easy to do. I mean, you just have to put the the plant in the ground and it's it's done, you know, by August. Nice. Done. (laughs) You've been renovating the basement? Yeah, I set it up as a music studio. I built... This wall, the yellow wall there, and there's my laundry machine over there. Probably could see it better if I turned the light off. You know, I got the guitars everywhere. Like the whole thing going on. Oops. Anyway, you know, I got the drum set and everything. Nice. I got the old Nashville tone coming, pumping out of this twin reverb amp too. So you just been working on the house, working on the garden, you writing some you sent me a couple new demos. You record those just on your garage band? Yeah, I always record on garage band. It's sounding good. The ones that I work on really like the I have like a lot of songs, but the ones that I uh work on the most turn out the best and people tend to compliment me on 
but I I don't really uh, I'm 34 now and I don't really do it as much as I used to I, 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 I write songs just as often I just don't take them all the way to the recordings you know I don't always record them there are too many of them and that's fine it's crazy that you remember I guess it's not so crazy that you remember your unrecorded songs I just haven't been in that in that like mindset for so long usually I'm like if I have a song idea I have to go record it right away or I'm worried I'll forget it and for some reason I just don't sit down with a guitar and hash out a song like I used to without a recording software but maybe I should maybe some of my best songs were just before I thought I could just record a demo into a DAW but your yours are sounding much better than like before we started recording together and I and we just like listened through your like heirloom demos or whatever that kind of demo session was called. That yeah, that was a demo session. That's a defunct project. Uh, cause Mike Leordi got, I mean, Mike, uh, Shulk, I, I got three mics in my life. Got Mike Shulk, Mike Leordi and Mike Baker, my brother. So I'm, I'm a little mixed up, but, uh, there's Mike a lot of Mike Shulk. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Shulk, uh, record was, was, we were supposed to start a band called heirloom heirloom, but it yeah. never happened. And it was just supposed to be my songs. So that's what, how that came about the, the name anyway. Gotcha. I mean, they didn't like sound awful they were just My, not as engineer not not engineered as well as your new stuff is i mean they're just demos anyway but the new stuff's actually like pretty uh pretty listenable well thank you that's what i was trying for i was homeless when i recorded those other demos so i didn't have a studio right i didn't have you know yeah, i was desolate when I oh. met you, you were living out of Barbie's garage, weren't you? That old lady who calls herself yeah. Barbie. Yeah. Yep. Barbara. Barbie. Yep. And then you didn't have a phone for like the three years after that. And every time I'd roll through Cincinnati, I'd search high and low for Alex Baker. And I remember someone gave me Barbie's number. I can't, it might have been Mike Shock. Yeah, I remember calling her. I was like, this lady doesn't sound like what I picture Barbie sounding like. <laughs> and then uh, she was like, yeah, I'll get Alex one second. And I was like, no way, I found <laughs> Alex Baker, yes. And then uh, from there, we met up every time I came to Cincinnati, hung out, recorded an album in 14 hours in your, in your new apartment. That was pretty impressive, wasn't it? Yeah, dude, I've never, <laughs> I've never recorded an album that quick. And the whole time, I was thinking like, "Wow, all of this is like gold. These are all really good takes, and I'm keeping all of this." And then some things we had to like, a quick little figure out, quick little lead guitar riff here, and then I took it on the road and yeah. added a bunch of piano in different venues. I remember in St. Louis, I got in trouble for playing piano at at like 1 a.m. after the show the venue owner came down he was like there's houses up here we're not allowed to make noise past 11 and I'm like oh shoot I'm in the middle of recording tea and then somewhere around somewhere around Las Vegas it was finished that's cool I always liked it how it said uh, recorded in Cincinnati St. Louis and wherever else it said or wherever else you said yeah. On the I, band camp page. I would get my bandmates uh, at the time, Christian and Brian Zawacki, to drive the van so that I could... Who, by the way, were present for the time of the recording. Right. They were they playing were, their Game Boys. They were playing their Game Boys <laughs> on the kitchen floor <laughs> while we were in the right. living room because all your apartment was in was my... a kitchen and a living room. And then, yeah, and then, yeah they came along for that summer... And before Warp Tour even started, the album January Blues was like 90% done. And then uh, we did Warp Tour, and then I went to Florida in like August. And 
bought a pair of studio monitors from the old guitar center and finished mixing, mixed my first record. Cause I, I didn't really know how to mix, but I bought studio monitors and I was like, oh, okay, I see what Steve Risen was doing, the guy who kind of taught me everything and mixes all my stuff. And he mixed the January Blues too, right? Well, he, he mastered it. So he was like, yeah, these mixes will do. Cause I mean, I couldn't really ask him to mix 11 songs. We had no budget. But he was like, you know what, like, good job for mixing all these and recording this guy. And now I still try and uh, make an excuse to go to Cincinnati so that we can hang out. And uh, we got like six more songs in the bag, pretty much. I'm just like finalizing some production touches and overthinking it. And also, I don't know if you feel the same way, but it's like, man, what is even the point of releasing music right now? Part of me believes that, you know? I, I, yeah, I see what you're saying. I know, I know exactly what you mean. It, it was fun when I was touring, and it was like, hey, if, if I could get this album done by September, I could bring Alex Baker on tour, and he could start making money selling his CDs at the merch table. Like, how, how amazing would that be for him? And then we and did I, and that. And I did. Yeah, I, I paid for my whole tr I paid for my whole trip by by getting people to buy my CD and then I'd like take it and spend it on beer or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just saying it funded it funded my very entertaining vacation. Yeah, all across the country. Rightfully so. You, you know, that that album should should still be selling thousands and thousands of people or. It, it's a shame that, like, we would have to pay $50 a year to put the album on Spotify and on Apple Music. And, that, and, and that's where I give up at that point. <laughs> I hear you. Because I'm not going to pay anyone 50 bucks just so, like, somebody might listen to my song. I don't give, I don't give a crap. No. Yeah, and it's it's frustrating. <laughs> it's just man. like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sign up for Tinder either. I'm not gonna get Tinder going because I have to pull out my credit card for that. I'm not gonna do it. Well, Sorry. technically you don't have to do for Tinder. Amazingly enough, for something like a dating app, you don't have to pay. But if you want to get your music on the streaming platforms, you better pay up, Bucko. Fifty bucks a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I've never actually been on Tinder.com. I literally have never even typed it in. So I used to... This is this is a good thing for the podcast that um, is a nice tour story. I used to use it to try and get people to come to shows. So I'd be on tour and I'd get to the right, city yeah. early. And I'd like, 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 like everyone. <laughs> and then the odd girl would be like, hey, I see you're from Toronto. Like, why are why are you here now? Did you move here? And I'd be like, no, I'm in a band. I'm playing a show. Like, you you should come out. Bring all your friends. It'll be really fun. We can hang out. Yeah, that's um, yeah, that's a good good use of it. Never worked. Never worked once. Oh. Then oh, maybe. I, I, after after about two years of trying it, the odd city. If I got there early enough, um, after a couple years of doing that, I switched my preferences to male and female. <laughs> and let me tell you, I got some interesting <laughs> gentlemen the out to my shows. The floodgates were opened. <laughs> it got, it's amazing how easy it is to get guys to come on a first date. I, I should phrase that differently. To <laughs> go out to a show to see this musician who uh, is on Tinder. And, like, I'd be honest. I would be like, look, I'm not actually gay, but... You know, I just wanted I, to see some people out at my show. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get people out to my show, and it would be really awesome to hang out, too. Like, we can totally grab a drink. Maybe, That's fine. Maybe, yeah, maybe you could meet a nice guy t here, too. Like, one of the other guys, the, the gay guys that I invited here. You know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that happened before, too. Uh, yeah. So, when I was really, really desperate to get people to the show was in Austin, Texas. And uh, the... The venue was called One to One Bar, and it was like, if you don't get people out to the show, A, you're never getting booked in Austin again, 
and B, you're not getting paid anything. <laughs> never be. <laughs> and it, you'll never be. You'll never make anything of yourself in this town. <laughs> it's it's a 21 plus show, and there's no cover. So I'm like, I should really be able to get some people out to the show. This was actually the first time I convinced a girl to come out to the show because she was like, yeah, I get it. I'm a musician too. Like, I'm there. And uh, I think two guys ended up coming out to the show. And one totally knew that um, I was straight. I, I mean, I didn't really even tell them this time. I was just like, yeah, whatever. Come to the show. Like, it'll be great. Um, and then this other guy... Uh, was like wanting to help move my gear and was really nice and I was like oh man this is this is getting this is going too far and even the the girl that was there was like hey like you should probably tell him that you're straight and I was like yeah I know I know I got to tell him like now before uh, before he tries to make a move or before he like Leaves all upset. So I'm like, hey, man, like, I should tell you I'm straight. <laughs> and he goes, oh, yeah, no, that's that's totally cool. I mean, I figured, you know, you, you're just a musician rolling through town, like, got to get people out to the show. It makes sense. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm glad you understand. And then he's, like, moving my keyboard outside and, uh, and puts it down, and then he's gone. And I was like, oh, I guess... Uh, I guess he had to go or something, but then he writes me like a three-page message on how wrong that is and how it's so hard for him to find guys. I felt so bad, um, and I was like, "Dude, I feel really bad." Well, like, I, th yeah, my excuse if I were you would be like, "I think Tinder is stupid." <laughs> yeah, no, there's there's a lot of excuses, but uh, at the same time, I was like, you know, this person was hurt by my actions, and... Um, yeah, that doesn't feel good. Yeah, so I stopped doing it after that, um, but hey, it worked, and, and some of the fans that I ended up making through it still, you know, follow what I do, and might even, might even be following this person podcast already which would be amazing like so, some people in nashville because nashville is another really tough one where <laughs> if you don't get people out good luck trying to book another nashville show i had i had a lot of experiences in nashville where uh people would be like why the hell are you here you're in a band here what what in the hell are you, don't you know we already have enough bands here right you know why are you why are you trying to make it in Nashville when it's so saturated here? Like get a clue, buddy. Why don't why won't you try and yeah. why don't you try and build a following in a city that doesn't have nine musicians for every 10 people? I would have to retort by saying that Nashville was actually in all honesty a good place to play music if you're talented but you have to be talented yeah and that's the, that's the catch right and uh, you guys did so well in nashville your band dewey decibel because you guys were really good and uh we did but we didn't we didn't have a it wasn't a smashing success but we did better than most bands did yeah yeah we got written up as the band of the month on the deli magazine.com nashville back in the day we got written up on npr you know we got a lot of good press, and we and we played a lot of crowded shows, you know. Right. So. And you're always gonna get haters in every city, that are like, "Why are you even here? Like, what's your band?" Especially online, and and back in the golden days, the glory days, because that was what 2008, 2009. You guys were killing it down there. It was uh no it was uh it was 2008 and 2007 actually. It was okay. Oh, yeah. 2000, yeah, 2007 yeah. was a really good year for like all local no, scenes. No, no, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I moved there in. I lived there for two years. I moved there in 2007, and I moved out in 2009. And the the dusting was released in 2009. Right. That's what happened. Yeah. I feel like that's that's when a huge collapse came. Like when the economy died. I feel like kids stopped going to shows, especially like local shows, because it was like. My parents can't give me 10 bucks every weekend to go to a show anymore. It seemed like that when we were touring across America in 2008, it was great. And then around the end of that year, 2009, things really started to die. Like we'd go to malls to promote and the malls 
everything was shutting down in the malls. And it, for it, for us being 18, 19, we were like, this is weird. Like, we've never seen anything like this. Like, these malls are basically ghost malls now. But in the glory days of 2007, 2008, you, you would see uh, a lot of, like, hate online even like 2004 2005 when my band was just starting there would be this 905 board and um um underground rail maybe that was the venue there was like all these local scene websites and each scene would have them but we were you know we didn't travel anywhere yet but i'm sure nashville had them too where uh, bands would go on bashing other bands and memes were just starting um, where like people would put up I don't know any kind of like thing to bash another band like this is what I think of this band and it was always yeah. out of jealousy and envy of course yeah of course <laughs> like we were the young yep. band in town so we would get a lot of like you know the classic hate on too much distortion, our amps were too loud, all this stuff, because, well, it, I mean, a lot of it was true, I but, mean, like, pe people couldn't just accept, oh, these young kids are really, you know, trying to trying to make it with their music, let's support them. A few people would, but everyone else in older bands was always, like, they were always hating on us um, just because they knew that there was, uh, there was a lot of potential for us to... Um, steal their 15, 16, 17 year old fans because we were that age and obviously people, people can be very territorial totally. don't you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. especially when something's booming like for, for here in Canada you should see what oh, yeah. the, the hockey scene is like like the parents for, for these 7, 8, 9 year old kids they're insane because they're they think their kid has this chance to be the next Wayne Gretzky, right? Or or yeah. or to to pay off their mortgage by shooting a puck in the net, right? So yeah. they're gonna do everything they can to sabotage the other parents and get their kid the most ice time and put their kid on the best line with the best players so they get a lot of goals themselves. And uh, and it goes right up until they're like you know. 15, 16 years old, that these parents are going through the nastiest time of their lives of being territorial and animal yep. instincts, man. They're, they're just protecting their kids. <laughs> it's just the way of the world. You got a one-track mind to the Ferris wheel. You know, and I'll let you have it, you know. <laughs> that's what that's about. That's what it's about. It's everybody's rushing to yeah. this Ferris wheel, you know. You really use your own imagery in your own head to get everybody universally on board with the idea of what the song is about. And that's the biggest reason too why I'm like I got to get I got to get this guy's music heard by more people. And I wish we could just throw it on Spotify for free. <laughs> but <laughs> Well, how much does it cost? It's like What's the cost again? It's 50 bucks a year, which you're lucky to make off of just streams. And no one's going to... I mean, some people will buy it off of iTunes, and, and you'll make 750 right there. Because that's, that's the only way you can get Alex Baker's music right now, is off of Bandcamp. And a lot of people have, when like it first came out, the first couple years, people were like, I finally downloaded Alex Baker. But like this year... And last year, everyone's just streaming. Like, that's the new way of... And I know you don't care whether people listen to your music or not. And um, I understand that. It's not really worth it for someone like you who doesn't really care whether their music's heard to throw 50 bucks at each year at keeping your music online. Yeah, a year. It's not like a flat fee. It's not like 50 bucks and here you go, infinite, you know, playlist. Like, it's not, it's this membership thing. I used to go rent videos at Blockbuster, you know? Yeah. And, and now I have to stream everything. Now it's like my computer doesn't even have a DVD slot in it, you know? The, the idea of owning, like, a, a real copy of something is dead. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. And that, and, that makes me sad. And we're kind of like um, old millennials here that love those physical copies. And I understand that side of the argument, too. I understand both sides where it's like, hey, you don't want to have all that clutter when you can just pay a $10 subscription every month to listen to anything, anytime. I personally have a collection of CDs that I keep on a shelf on my wall and I like looking at them. I like looking up on, up on the wall and I like sitting in my chair and like, and like being like, which one do I want to listen to? And then, you know, at now, cause they're all sitting up there like real neat. And I like that. I don't, that's, I don't want to click her. I don't want to click around online to get a song. I want to do that. I want to physically like be uh, that's an old fashioned thing, but that's okay. I mean, it's okay for people to like to stream things too. I'm not saying that it's bad for people if they, if it's convenient for them, but I'm just saying I personally have never fallen into anything like that. Any kind of social media and stuff like honestly seems evil to me. You know, any kind of online capitalist gain seems evil to me, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm just, say, I'm just saying. Yeah, no, I, I know. I'm glad that that was brought up because that's, um, definitely something that you stand by like you don't even have an instagram a twitter i think you might have facebook just for messenger no i don't you deleted nope, that nope. too yeah. yes maybe that's why you're still writing great songs <laughs> because there's a lot of people that also feel like there hasn't been a good song written since 2007 Quite honestly, it puzzles me why people, uh, well, well, it doesn't make, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, like, okay, so I, you're saying I write good songs, right? But, uh, to me, I, I don't think my songs are that, I mean, I, I don't think they're bad, I don't think they're that great, though. <laughs> That's you being over, overly judgmental, which we all are on our own songs. I don't know, I just think that, I'd... I've noticed that uh, uh, I'm I, I'm not. I think the reason why I can write songs is because I'm a little out there. I'm a little bit of a weirdo, you know. I'm not. I really can't. I can't act normal. I'm not a normal person. So that's what I write about. Sometimes you write about that, uh, but sometimes you write about how the rest of the world is messed up. But who? Uh, which one is? is correct i mean with the state of the world right now maybe alex baker is not so weird yeah maybe the rest of the world i'm just saying i don't i'm not i'm not with the trend i, I don't have any kind of trend going on yeah no me. i get it but maybe alex baker chilling in his cincinnati home writing songs and planting trees and peppers and cilantro in his backyard is way more normal than the 17 year olds trying to get noticed on TikTok and um, yeah, be an influencer and, and create sort of a buzz off of. Okay, so maybe I'm not weird, but, but I'm just, uh, I'm not weird. I'm, I'm just, I Did follow the beat of my own drum. Yeah, you know? you're definitely different than. Yeah, w w where everyone else is at right now. But um, I haven't had a cell phone. I haven't had a cell phone for like ten years. Mm -hmm. So, and I think a lot of people. Everyone else, when you go out in public, everyone else is like, you know, they're looking down at their phone. They're like, oh, yeah. I gotta look at my phone. I've literally memorized the Cincinnati maps. Like I could, you could drop me off <laughs> any place in Cincinnati. And blindfold me and put me in the trunk and then, then like, th kick me out of the trunk and blindfold, and then I'd be able to walk back to my house. And because I know that, like, I don't need Google Maps. I, I know how the roads work. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's... Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of people would just say, well, that's, that's the old way. Like, maybe he's just someone who hasn't changed at all since he was 20 years old. But, like, you still... That's not that's not a good argument because you still grow as a person, you still grow as a songwriter, you still um, now you have this house, you're renovating your house, you're doing all the things that 
My house is sweet. I have a fucking great pad. I have an incredibly cool pad. I'm telling you. You do? You know, for me. <laughs> like, especially for me. And you like, got it for... This place is badass. <laughs> yeah, and it's like... <laughs> you got it for like a quarter of the price that it would have been in any other city in America. <laughs> At least a quarter. <laughs> Cincinnati is so cheap. That's because they think no one wants to live here. Because, like... Because it does suck here in a way, but it's also real beautiful. Like it's real hilly and yeah. it's, it's uh, got a lot of good parts to it. Yeah, I love it there. But yeah, my point is, I I wouldn't um, beat yourself up over being so different or worry that your songs aren't that great because not, you're so different. I'm just saying, I don't know how to take a compliment. That's all. It's like <laughs> you're saying that my songs are good and people want to hear them, and I'm just going like, ooh, you know. I don't have much to say to that. <laughs> you know well the point of this That's podcast it. is to try and inspire other artists and get your music known and heard and your message and um mindset kind of out there so that people can relate and i think a lot of people are going to relate to this or at least see it as something like maybe i should take a page out of alex baker's book and put my phone down for a week and see where it gets me. And, you know, instead of looking at my phone all day, <laughs> why, why, why don't I just try and, like, improve my house or try and get a house or try and um, get to the next, the next stage of my life? Because as much as you're um, kind of off the grid with your music and you're not an influencer by any means... Something like this platform might get people who are trying to be influencers to be like, hey, this guy is, this guy seems like he's living a great life. And you might not think that, but compared to what a lot of other people are going through with. I think I live a good life. I, I'm privileged. I have a roof over my head and I have food to eat, you know? Yeah. I'm pro like, not, not everybody's got that. So in that way, I'm happy. You know? Good. Well, I'm slow by nature. I am. I'm not dumb, but I'm slow. Like, it takes me a while to to figure something out. But once I figure it out, I can figure it out really well. You know? I, I, I know all the ins and outs of it. It's just a different process than, than, other peop than, than most people I see. Yeah, and I would argue that you figure it out a lot. You figure it out a lot better than most people you see, and maybe that's patience. Maybe that's just straight up patience, because you are patient with your songwriting. I guess that's one thing that I've found recently is really annoying. Is I'm not nearly as patient as when I was like seventeen, eighteen, working on a song. Now I'm like, oh, I want to just like go do something else or. I don't know if this song is, I start to get judgmental on it, maybe because I've just written so many songs that I'm like, eh, this is another one for the garbage can. Um, <laughs> yeah. Whereas, like, I don't know, do you take a song all the way? I know you don't start recording it right away, like I do maybe, but do you take it all the way so that you have a full song or at least a, a two verses and a chorus? No. No, I'll write like a like a one line and I'll and I'll quit until I have some other idea for it. I put my all my songs. I could play them in a big medley. They're all basically one big song, you know. It's all just a work in progress. To me, I don't really enjoy writing songs. Believe it or not, I don't like. I mean, I just it's something. It's like a reflex. It's like a. Mm -hmm. It's like my elbow jerking up. You know, I literally do it on accident. It's an accident. And the things that I say in my songs are an accident. You know, I, I, I don't have any greater meaning or message for anyone. The songs do are meaningful, but that's just by coincidence. That's just like um, having something to say and not being able to keep your mouth shut about it. You know, that's what it's like. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. But, man, like everything you're even saying right here. It's all meaningful to someone. All your songs are meaningful. Well, what about you? Is it meaningful to you? Yeah, totally. I mean, what I'm what I'm saying right now, I mean, I know the songs are meaningful to you, but... No, I feel like every time we talk about this kind of stuff of, like, being different than 
um, the the rest of the world, the how did you put it, the standard flow of society. It's so interesting to me because. A, I feel like you're a great artist, and B, I feel like I can relate in some sense, but um, sometimes the most frustrating thing for me too is I'll get like sucked in by it because I feel like I have to. Like I feel like, oh, I have to promote this show or this podcast or um, all of these things so that I can have a sustainable career or have something that... Um, so that my message and Alex Baker's message and whoever I have on um, or my favorite bands that I get to play with so that they are inspiring the next generation so that we keep rock and roll alive. Like whatever, whatever I'm feeling at the time will drive me to fall into that trap basically. But when we talk about this and when we just work on music and take our time with it, and really experiment with different ideas, I feel like none of that shit really matters. And I'm, this is bliss. Like we're working on art. This is all I need. I don't care if any, like I'm, I'm on that same page with you. I don't care if anybody hears this. It would be great so that we can continue to do this. Um, life, but, is a, life is a journey. Life is a journey and it's just, it's just like level two in Super Mario World. You it's know. like a game, yeah. And there's level three and level four and everything. So, it it, it uh, your music will last forever, whether or not anyone remembers it or not. But it will be there, you know. Yeah, they might not. They might not find it till you're seventy, eighty years old. Even who knows what life's gonna look like then, if music's even gonna be a thing. <laughs> Oh, I love listening to these vintage recordings of Rosedale and Alex Baker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> vintage. It's my bag. <laughs> you never know, man. You never know. But. I don't know. I, I, I feel like I'm coming across as, like, really depressing or something. But um, you're asking me about my music. And, and the reason why it's, like, taking a depressing turn is because, like, it's all connected with my emotions and things. You know? Like, it's all connected with every everything like that. It's connected deeply personal with me, you know. And um, so I, I don't want to come... I, I, I don't want to... I mean, I don't want to break... I don't want to hate to break it to everybody, but uh, this music that you like to listen to, if you do, if you've heard it before, if you liked any of it, it's because I was depressed as shit when I wrote it. And that's how it sounds so real, you know. I was literally, like, desolate depressed... You know, no, no hope. So. Yeah, January Blues definitely has that pain in it. Um, but, like, you have some newer stuff that is just straight up catchy, like popular. I don't think you were in a desolate, depressed state when you were writing no. popular. No, but I was talking shit about somebody. And the, it's... The, it, like, not, not somebody, but, like, just a, a movement of people. Like, mm -hmm. a, a group of people. Right. That have, that have different ideals than I do. That's what I was talking about. And it's great. It's so good. I don't think people are, are going to listen to this. Like, listen to this cynical old man tell me that I'm living my life wrong. I don't think they're going to think that. I I'm think, not telling it. I don't think anyone... I think... I, I actually wish people... Would, just I want people to do what they want to do I really yeah. do I, I'm very open minded I have I have like uh, I, I'm very you know I, I I'm not homophobic I want gay people to be gay people and I'm and I want black people to you know have a good commu better community than they have um, and uh, I, I want love and peace and, and like I really do and I've been like that ever since I was a kid uh and I guess I think some part of that is because like I've always been very very tall like you have, and um, people Birds sort of you. look to me as being like, yeah. I don't really yeah I don't know it's a little abstract but I I just think that uh, being big is an advantage so like it gives you an advantage. Yeah, on more than just playing basketball and reaching things in the top shelf, you kind of have yeah. this different perspective on life and 
Um, I feel that too. Like, I feel like uh, 90% of the people I meet are, their first in impression is, whoa, look how tall he is, or look how, how tall are you, or they're, they don't even talk to you. It's interesting that you get a lot of people that don't ever talk directly to you, but because... Yeah, they snicker behind your back. <laughs> they, they talk to the person that they're with, hey, that guy is so tall, like almost like he's not even one of us. He doesn't even understand the language that we're speaking. Then it's, then it's speaking. obvious that they're, that they're looking up at you like this. They're like, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh. Like, <laughs> and, and obviously they know that you understand what they're saying, but they almost feel like he must be fine with it because he's so tall. And like, he's got he's to gotta expect well, yeah, that we're going to be talking advantage. about him. Yeah, it's an advantage. Like he won, and he's got to he's got to be expecting that we're gonna talk about him. So I don't even mind if he sees yeah. me talking to you right now, going, <laughs> "Whoa, he's tall," and that's ninety percent of people. But it's also interesting perspective for us because we get the advantage of knowing if someone is oblivious right off the bat. If someone is a down to earth person on the first impression, we're able to tell. Because those 10% of people that are down to earth are gonna be like, oh, this is a tall person and I don't need to remind them of that and I don't need to make them uh, feel uncomfortable. I bet they get that all the time. They get that I, all the time. I bet they get it all the time. And <laughs> I, I don't need to go snicker to my friend right now and whisper to them whether they're tall or not. Um, so that like that's an example of an advantage that um, we have as tall people that we that I don't think a lot of people realize um, that you're exposing yourself to me right now that you are not very smart <laughs> by by whispering to your friend <laughs> expecting me to accept yeah. it or not even realize it <laughs> you know what I mean I don't know how to explain it but I it's think like you're not very smart or you're just very young and, and, and right, so right. naive you know that yeah, you could tell if someone's naive right off the bat. Um, I, I started this uh, thing where, well, Nick from um, the band I'm in in San Diego, Mainsail, he started, and he because a lot of people that I'm with get annoyed by it because they're like, I'm sick of hearing about how tall my friend here is, and like, do you not realize how stupid you're being? Um, so he started this thing where if someone says it, like, hey, you're tall, or makes a joke, they owe me a drink. He'll be like, oh, you owe him a drink. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been implementing it in different situations. And I, I usually give him the drink because he started it. But uh, uh, there was one time outside of San Francisco show um, at the Honey Hive. It's just like kind of a rundown area. And uh, we're loading out our gear and talking with all the bands after the show. And this lady walks up the street. And, you know, if I wasn't there, she wouldn't have said anything. But, of course, she had to say, whoa, you're very tall to just me. Like, that's the thing, too, is when we're in a group with a bunch of people, the only person who's going to get the, like, um, interaction is us because we're over six foot eight, right? So, uh, yeah. So this lady's like, wow, you're tall. And I'm like, oh, you owe me a drink. And she's like, oh, what? Like, that's that's clever. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, anytime someone mentions my height out of nowhere, some stranger. I'm going to, Mike, Mike, I'm totally going to do that now. I'm seriously going to fucking do that. She went to 7-Eleven across the street. She's like, what kind of drink you want? I'm like, oh, I'll take a, a White Claw. <laughs> so she goes across the street <laughs> and, and walks back. Like, she was on her way the other direction, went to 7-Eleven, walked back, gave me the drink, and I was like, this That's is awesome. This is great. So it also, uh, <laughs> it, it gives people a second chance. If they are, uh, you know, yeah. coming out of their shell to be completely naive and, ob <laughs> and obnoxious and talk about my height, then uh, you, 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 can, you can repair it by getting me a drink. Yeah. So you should definitely uh, no, do that. No, tr no troubles, bubbles. No troubles, bubbles. Oh, you haven't heard of the tall. You haven't heard of the tall rules, the tall club. Because everyone hands off. You know those, those stupid. Have you seen those cards? I'm uh, I'm six foot seven. 
Uh, no, I do not yeah. play basketball. That meme that was going around yeah, for a that, while? Yeah, yeah. I so saw I, it, yeah. I have the rules written out in an email to myself, very extensive, and like there's there's some, uh, if you ask, hey, how tall are you? You don't have to get me a drink because that's curiosity and, and we, uh, we accept curiosity, that's fine. I mean, if you wanna ask me how tall I am, that, that you know, you wanna get the number. I, I'm obviously taller than average, so here it is, six foot nine. Enjoy that information. Congratulations, you don't have to get me a drink. It's just curiosity, that's fair. <laughs> I mean, this this is not me being a snowflake. I've been taking this shit all my life and I accept it, but if everybody else is gonna be a snowflake about this what and is that. A, what, the hell is a, what the hell is a snowflake? I don't snowf- even know what that means. A snowflake mean. is like is like the the people on Twitter right now who everything offends them. Like me I don't even- see, I don't have Twitter, so I don't know. Me even <laughs> talking about this right now, talking about the snowflakes is like a big no-no. Like I'll be canceled for, for talking about this. Yeah. So like that's a big thing and and just like what you said, it? it's not me. It's not me trying to be like a mean person. Like I accept everyone who, for who they are, but as soon as like you talk about the snowflakes in general and how like everything offends them, and they'll try and cancel you for saying something that is a little out of the box or whatever, um, that is like a huge no no right now because it's like no you're supposed to accept everyone for who they are which i do but on the topic of hey if someone is going to expose my height to everybody in the room to get a laugh isn't that like making fun isn't that what the term making fun is so that everybody you know gets a laugh at your expense i think to make up for that, I'm not going to cancel you, but you should owe everybody in the room a drink. I think that that's fair. That's <laughs> fine, yeah. <laughs> I, I'll just go a, along with that. Just sure. a small penalty. <laughs> it's just height. I get it, you know? It's an advantage, sure. But if, yeah. if you're going to use someone's physical appearance to benefit yourself, then you should probably pay a small price pay a small penalty the downside of the downside the the hidden downside of being tall i don't know if you've experienced this as much as i have but is that the second i walk into some place people think i'm threatening them like they they like stand up out of their chairs they like rise up and they like look at me like i'm about to like throw a brick through the glass or something you know I get that in like a really, um, like what we were initially talking about where like, you know, people get envious, so then they feel like they need to um, show their power and strength and want to fight me. Like, uh, Doug. Yeah, I've had people, yeah. (laughs) One one of the, they just just want to fight you because they're like, either they want to say I fought someone who's six foot nine, I'm not scared of anything, um, or it's like, Hey, I don't f- I don't feel like the alpha male anymore. I don't feel dominant anymore here at this bar because this huge guy walked in. Like who does he think he is being that mm-hmm. tall? You know, mm-hmah. why did why did yeah, he and then get you those? start then you start singing so beautifully and then they're really <laughs> really insecure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you <laughs> you must really get that. Jeez. You know, small man syndrome, um, bad band syndrome. You know, people get really... <laughs> people in shitty bands, yeah. envious of people who actually have content. <laughs> yeah, like when, like when we were talking about how you got uh, on the Jimmy World show, and everyone mm-hmm. everyone was like immediately, you know... Not well, everyone, but not, there were there was a huge voice. Right, the, the, the voice that was like, you know, screw coconut milk, they're not that great. They're not, you know... They're not as yeah, good as us. They suck anyway. They suck anyway. They suck anyway. And then here's Jim Atkins coming. Everybody's everybody's hero in the local scene coming on and being like, "So we like the coconut milk song." And uh, what song did you submit again? I didn't. Su- your friend Taylor from Virginia Beach. No way. Uh, Taylor Helm submitted. was the one who did it. Yeah. Wow. Wow, I gotta yeah. have him on. And I didn't even, I didn't even, I didn't even know about it. What a beauty! Like, I didn't try to get the gig. 
he just like said like, hey, why don't you check out coconut milk? They're pretty good. And he sent co- uh, he sent honeysuckle trees. Nice. And uh, I didn't even know about it until I was selected. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you guys didn't even submit yourselves <laughs> and you're winning the opening slot. And like, we won. <laughs> yeah. Ah, I, I guess we're available that day to open for Jimmy Eat World. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun too, man. They were they were really nice and, and we got to take a picture with them and um, talk to them a little bit. It was very fun. I really appreciate the opportunity that, that they gave me, you know. Yeah, no, that's huge. And and I I got off the stage and 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 I remember the feeling you know because yeah. cause I I played my set that night and uh, I didn't think I didn't think I did that great or anything I was just like oh, I was okay you know that's basically how I always feel you yeah know? oh yeah uh, but I mean y- I could have done better <laughs> yeah I did better at rehearsal right yeah it's always <laughs> the case. But I just remember the feeling of walking into the crowd. I wanted to walk through the crowd and just see if anyone could pick out that I was the dude that was just on stage. Yeah. And I was like swamped. I was swamped by like, you know, people saying, oh, good job, 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 good job. Good job. Hey, man, good job. I, like, I really like that. Hey, man, good job. <laughs> yeah, you get that huge, that huge rush of acceptance of dopamine. Of like, wow, everybody here, everybody here approves. I don't even care if I played the best show ever anymore. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any songs in mind that I wanted to play. I didn't prepare anything. Oh, just I was just some... waiting for you to tell me to play this or that. Oh. And plus, uh, I was screaming at my brother the other day, and my voice is not at 100%. It's still good. Like, I could still sing, and I will. But... I was screaming at my brother the other night. You know, I'm not ashamed. He's a dick. Well, that's a perfect opportunity to let you know that vocally is... I, I need it right now. I love that stuff. It's great. Yeah. Um, well, when I come back through, I'll get you some. But to everyone listening, yeah, you can get... Yeah, I ran out. You can get 15% off by using the link below to get your very own vocal ease. So... <laughs> So just go to vocalese.com slash Mike Liorti, I believe, is the, is the link that'll get you 15% off. <laughs> and Alex Baker <laughs> loves it, so if you want to sing like Alex Baker, you got to get that vocalese in you. These, these lemon drops are really good, too, and um, throat drops. I'll, I'll have to... Have to hook you up. Well, it's good. It's got it's got natural ingredients in it. It's got all the all the good stuff you drink oh, yeah. tea for and everything. But it's like it's like you get, it's a stage thing. Like you can't have a hot cup of tea on stage at all times. You don't have a percolator. You don't have like the the boiling system. You know. Yeah. Yep. You just spray it right in, and then you're ready to rip. Ready you don't to have go. to wait for the kettle <laughs> to, to boil. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. Let's hear some tea, Alex. Since uh, we've been talking about tea and vocalese. Tea, really? Is that the one? Is that the one you want to hear? That's the one. That's this is the first song I've I heard you play in uh, Cincinnati that one day. All right, this is this this might suck, so just bear with me, cause my voice, and it has the falsetto chorus. You know, we'll see how it goes. I'm confident you got it. my coffin under the Allegheny moon Winter time on the western shoreline You could never mind your senses, you don't need them to be bold All I ever do is fall in love with you to drink some tea with you All I ever do is fall in love with 
Just to drink some tea with you And all I ever do Is fall in love With you, girl I need your advice Well done, bucko Was it? Was it okay? Yeah Was, was it off key? Was it terrible? No, no. sounded good I just hope the amp isn't too loud, but um, especially when you're like, about the, uh, what? What about the performance? Because I just about like killed myself playing that. Let's let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. Was I singing off key? No, 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 no. Okay, that's good. Well, that's the first. That 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 makes me. That gives me a. I'm I'm relieved. I don't think you, you know. know. You know, like once you know how to sing, I don't think you know how to sing off key. Yeah. Like, very rarely am I going through your playlist, comping your vocals, being like, ooh, he was pitchy on that one. Unless you just, like, you know, were really distracted or, like, were trying something. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that happens when you're trying something. Right. I don't know. I, I don't, like, I really, I honestly don't even enjoy, like, playing music i've only done it like this is like completely honest I, i've only ever done it to get a girlfriend that's like my only goal but you're good at it and obviously there's more to it than that i mean you might have started because of that but obviously there's more of a there was a deep passion in there for songwriting and your heroes and inspiration that yeah but I, you're just saying like the actual physical act of playing songs is like I don't actually enjoy these three and a half minutes right now. I'm only doing it. Oh, I hated playing tea just now. I hated it the whole fucking time. I don't know if you could see it in my face or whatever or whatever. I don't know what I looked like when I was singing it, but I hated it. Just to be honest, I hated it. It looked like you That's were having... an old song and I don't want to sing it. Yeah. But I will. It looked like you were having fun. Oh, I because... guess I'm a good actor. No, honestly, like... I think that that's a, I think that that's a common misconception for a lot of performers is like, it is, um, especially a song you've played hundreds of times, 
it is kind of a task and it is kind of like a all right I'll do this it's kind of a favor like I'll do this for you listener if this is something that you want to hear yeah what you gonna what are you gonna buy me a drink now like <laughs> it's it's a it's a little like taking out the trash though because you're like I don't I don't really want to do this but I know that um, it's for there's there's a little bit of benefit in there and if not well whatever I mean it, it didn't it's not gonna kill me to do but um, to the to the listener and to the audience it all it usually comes across as like look how much fun this person's having hmm. you know yeah and like that's weird because that's not how I'm feeling at all. It's weird. It, it, it's totally. Part of it is an act, I guess. Like when I play Taylor Swift for the five thousandth time, I Taylor Swift. <laughs> I would rather play something else, and I uh, am thinking like oh man i really don't i i if i fuck up the riff that's gonna really piss me off like this is a kind of a stressful <laughs> moment um but it's it's for someone and they're gonna enjoy it so i'm kind of getting their enjoyment it's almost like the audience feels like wow look how much this person's enjoying their music their performance doing what they do it's magnetic i'm do they think i'm that enjoying though? this that's what make that's a lot of what makes them enjoy it especially if it's their first time hearing it like people who don't like my genre of music whatever it is they will see me at a bar running around having a light show syncopated to the song with a video of me playing all the other instruments it looks like i'm having a great time i'm dripping in sweat i'm smiling I'm selling this. I'm selling the song, and then I'll get this compliment usually. Hey, that's not really my genre of music. I don't really listen to that sort of warp tour music, but I loved hearing your set. I loved watching you up there have fun. Like I'll get that compliment all the time. And uh, oh yeah, I was having so much fun. You have no idea. <laughs> well, I, I mean, part of it, yes. I mean. I, I'm having a, I'm having a good time, like reaching my goals, I guess too, right? Because a lot of a lot of it's that. Like I'm trying to I'm trying to be. Uh, I think I think people forget that music is a job. I think they forget yeah. it's a job. It's like it's just an underpaid job. You know, it's like right. a it's a it's a profession that's not respected. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, but I, I mean, I, I don't think they're telling me that because they think that uh, it's it's not a job. I just think that a lot of people, um, may, are, they're pulled in by the presence that you have when you're performing. Like you still, you still were present during that performance. It was probably you probably didn't like doing it because being present at something that you've done a million times is is not a fun task it's like taking out the garbage you got to go do it but the audience is thinking like look at this person mastering their craft they've done this a lot this is entertaining to me and then me playing taylor swift is like look how much the audience is joy is enjoying this tongue-in-cheek song that i've built a yeah. whole production around i'm i'm smiling because they're smiling and it's this back and forth where the real the reason why i think taylor swift is funny is because it's such a stupid message for a song right and then you put like all this production into it <laughs> <laughs> it's like <laughs> dude i i am waste i am wasting my time doing anything but that aren't i like that that is that should be my niche right like i should just keep doing that yeah <laughs> Just the big, big sarcastic dry joke about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, though, when the guitar is loud, it makes me sing more passionately. Yeah, I hear yeah. that, too. Yeah, I get that. And it's more fun, right? Like, yeah, that's another thing is, especially when you can't, when you don't have a good mix and you have to perform for an hour, it's like... This isn't even fun for me. I'm not, I don't even get to hear my 
guitar that I love to hear so much. Yeah. Like that's that's part of the fun for a, for a performer is like I get to hear my gear and play it. But if I can't even hear that because the mix, you know, it doesn't allow for it, then it's really not enjoyable. All right, here she blows. All right. This song's called Popular because it's fine to be popular. Settle down by the pool in the cool of the evening. I know I got a fire to build you now. She stays hid, sits pretty, owns five cottages. Cause I know I've got to find a space to occupy. Ain't it fine to be popular? She stays hid, sits pretty, sent her babies off to colleges. And I know I've got to find a way to organize any fun to be popular, simple minds can be popular, and you will spin me any other ways as long as there's land as long as there's sand around you oh you could spin me any other ways as long as there's land as long as there's sand around you oh settle down by the lake in the wake of the old days Cause I know I've got a display to show you now. Ain't it fun to be popular? Simple minds can be popular. Oh, you could spin me any other ways as long as there's land as long as there's sand around you you could spin me any other ways as long as there's land as long as there's sand around you yeah how was that it was good some lyric changes there and the last one too well, I don't have the lyrics. One of the reasons why I don't like to play that song is because I can't remember the lyrics every time I get into it. I'm really? Like, it, it's not a song that really means that much to me. Other people like it. Yeah. It's catchy. See, I, yeah. I hear the same... I'm not, I'm not too enthused. I, I hear the same take over and over and over and over. So I... Uh, I know the lyrics to all your songs very, very well. Sorry if that was a big fat disappointment to you then because like I just winged it. You know? No, I not don't, at all. I don't, I, don't, I don't practice. I don't practice. I don't like music. I don't like my own music. I hate it, actually. I think that it's a curse, not a blessing. And um, I don't, you know, try to learn my own lyrics. Like, yeah. okay? You know, <laughs> like that... That's literally where I'm coming. That's the planet I'm beaming in from, you know? So if you like it, then I'm, if, if people like it, then I'm flattered. But if, if, if they don't and they think I'm just trying to like vibe for attention or something, then that's not, that's not correct. Yeah. I, uh, I only, I only do what comes naturally to me. I've always been that way. I don't know. I know I'm a, 
I'm depressed now. I'm depressed. <laughs> no. You're you're on you're on to something though. It's like I don't think a lot of artists can admit that, but I don't think that you have to love every second of playing music to be a musician. There's not there's actually very few times where it's like this is actually uh, really enjoyable right now. And I, I know that you feel that sometimes too. Like, I don't want everybody to get the wrong impression that you hate every second of playing music all the time. Yeah, you might hate practice. Yeah, you might hate writing. Yeah, you might hate playing certain songs. But at some point, you're playing for the enjoyment of, hey, this is, this is similar to my heroes my my influences this is what i am inspired to create so there is a there is sort of a medicine side to it too i think it's not just that's what a job. i use it for yeah um, i use it for the therapy of it it's like it really is like a therapy session right hey man do you want to can we talk a little bit like just candidly after this is that okay yeah we can we can turn the cameras off and then just hang out for a little bit like we did Tuesday night. Uh, please just turn the cameras off now. <laughs> yeah. Please. All right. All right. Thanks, Alex. Signing off from right. State of My Art. Rock on, everyone. <laughs> Sign or <us>, sweetheart. <laughs> oh, Mr. Alex Baker. What an interesting fella. Something about his transparent carelessness always puts me in a jolly mood. And he's such a talented artist with so much potential. I often feel like it's my duty to pull that talent and character out of him and give it to the world. So thank you so much for checking out this episode and this podcast. Once again, if you haven't already, check out Alex Baker's music on Bandcamp. It's alexanderbaker.bandcamp.com com, where you could find January Blues and his old band's album, The Dusting. And if you like this podcast episode, you will probably like the other episodes. So please visit State of My Art Podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, or YouTube. Be sure to follow, subscribe, like, comment, leave a review. All that stuff really helps, especially in the early stages of this podcast. So thank you again for tuning in and being a part of this and hanging out with me. I hope to see you guys next week. Thanks again for tuning in. Mm-hmm.